Join Edwin Frondozo on the Business Leadership Podcast every week for a unique program featuring insights and actionable items from the world's most successful business leaders. Hear firsthand the exclusive interviews and personal journeys on how today's transformational leaders made it to the top. Just know that you are going to listen with happy ears. And that's okay, that's human. And just because you found some things when you joined a new company that weren't perfect, doesn't mean you didn't make the right decision. It is actually your opportunity to shape that new leadership team is in that void. This is the Business Leadership Podcast and I'm your host, Edwin Frondozo. Thank you for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate you. On this week's episode, I sit down with Paul Rubenstein, the Chief People Officer at Vissier, a leading people analytics and workforce planning solution that helps its clients find the answers they need to strategically manage a complex workforce. With over 25 years of experience within consulting and working in HR, Paul has immersed himself with leading the transformation of talent strategies and HR functions. Recently, Paul has worked with senior executives from Global 2000 organizations to help them drive change through data-driven HR practices. In our conversation, we take a deep dive on the value of analytics and data within today's workforce management solutions. He shares why business leaders need to embrace the assistance of machine learning and artificial intelligence. And we also talk about having and adopting the engineering mindset. Today's podcast is brought to you by True Shield Insurance, Canada's most trusted insurer for entrepreneurs and small businesses. Without further ado, here we go. Welcome to the Business Leadership Podcast, Paul. Thank you. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. I'd love it if you could actually maybe just introduce yourself to the listeners today. If you could tell us who you are and what you like to do when you're not growing and leading businesses. Uh, I'm Paul uh, Rubenstein. I am a freshly, um, I've just relocated from Brooklyn, New York to Vancouver, British Columbia. So a lot of my free time is spent uh, learning how to live in a foreign country that looks like something you're familiar with, but possibly isn't. Uh, other than that, <laughs> I'm uh, I'm married. Uh, I am the dog dad of a um, uh, overly large uh, standard poodle, and we spend a lot of time um, exploring the wilderness of uh, Vancouver right now. Oh, amazing! I mean, that's a that's a quite a bit of a change from Brooklyn, to, uh, New York to Vancouver, BC. Um, are you enjoying the fresh air? Yeah, I, I will tell you, it's uh, there are two. This is the second, um, well, actually, third time I've left New York. Uh, I keep going back, but there are two types of people who leave New York uh, and go to a new place. The ones who go, "Oh, this is not New York," and the ones who go, "Oh, this is not New York." Um, <laughs> and each time you have to, you know, it's much healthier when you fall into the latter camp and you begin to understand uh, the natural beauty and um, the nature of the unique nature that each place has to offer. And I will tell you, Vancouver's pretty amazing. There's a reason it always lands in those top 10 places to live uh, lists. Yeah, no. And, uh, and when, when did you, when did you relocate? Was it recently? Have you experienced winter going skiing or any of that yet? This is my sixth month now. Uh, it's my sixth month anniversary. Yay. And, um, you know, Vancouver winter is not so bad. The natural beauty, uh, you know, like you said, around it is great. The summers are amazing. As for skiing, skiing was built for people with uh, coordination and low centers of gravity. I am neither of those. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I'm going to stay away from the slopes. I'll leave that to uh, the rest of my family. Amazing. That's great. Well, welcome uh, to Canada. I do sit in Canada as well. I'm out in Toronto, so the other side of the world as well. Um, but why don't we just get right into it, Paul? Can you tell us a bit about your company, Vissier, what your current roles are, your responsibilities, and, and maybe if you can, 
maybe share to the world what you're trying to accomplish over the next six to 12 months. So uh, Vizier is pretty amazing. Um, I uh, spent a long time in the human capital space, consulting, uh, even some time in outsourcing. And, you know, I spent, uh, you know, in, when I was in consulting, I spent like two sides of the coin. Uh, one was, you know, straight up talent strategy. How do you get better business performance through people? And the other was, what does a fit for mission HR function look like um, to deliver on that talent strategy? So the economics and the technology. And man, a lot of people spend a lot of money on HR technology. And all those years putting in transaction systems, you know, helping people get more efficient with HR. I was always frustrated that we weren't um, putting in technology that actually helped move the needle on talent strategy and talent outcomes. And in my last consulting firm, I had the privilege of working in the Corp Dev Group where we looked at uh, portfolios uh, of markets and uh, our businesses. And I started looking at the big data area and Vizier was doing magic. They were without all those disjoint tools, the consultants and the data warehouses and just these armies of people, they had kind of pioneered this new thing called analytics application that was a whole new way of doing business intelligence and, P and data analytics. And they started with people and I saw this and I was like, wow. And so they had finally found a way to take the pain and torture out of delivering insights around people and made it consumable to humans. And I looked at that and I was like, wow, you finally have an HR technology that I can recommend that you can put not in the hands of the people who get transaction work done, but in the hands of business leaders and HR business partners and the people who are con you know, consumed with talent that allows them to tell stories with data, that allows them to see patterns that aren't visible to the naked eye, that allows them to not just use HR data, but be able to say, hmm, I want to understand the nature, the person, the characteristics of my best salespeople, but with data, not sort of the sales leadership's observations. And that's magic to me. So years later, I'd looked at them as an investment on behalf of the uh, old company I worked for. I fell in love. And, you know, six years later, here I am at the company. Uh, and I'm already on my second job here. I mean, that's amazing. It's uh, sounds like uh, almost a dream come true, I I'd like to say. But I guess for the, you know, for the listeners out there who may be thinking to themselves, what is this pain of developing some type of talent strategy? And, and you did mention a specific example, but maybe if you could talk about, and this is maybe for my benefit as well, Paul, like, what were the pains or specific, like what, when, when someone within the sales leadership is looking at this data now, like what are some of the insights that are coming through it? Like some of those ahas um, that's helping them develop that strategy out and, and grow from it. Yeah. So it, it, it's sort of like uh, for anyone who's read Moneyball, you begin to understand this. Uh, if you've ever worked with sales leaders, they're like, you know, this is what worked before. I've, I've seen this sort of grit, right? People love to talk about the grit of an employee or um, they have the chops or uh, I've seen them be successful before. Uh, and then the question is like, well, where's, where's the data, right? How do we actually know that person is going to be successful? How do we know early that they're going to be successful? How do we know early in the pipeline, what's the difference? What's the real difference between the experiences, aptitudes, things we could measure? How many network connections does a successful um, salesperson have versus a not successful salesperson? How many internal and external times, how many people, how many times does somebody touch uh, a client? Uh, what's the diversity of people that a salesperson touches that actually could predict a sale rather than, you know, the person who, yeah, they, they brought home a deal here, a deal there. And they, you remember those heroic deals. But what about the quiet ones? What about the ones that are um, doing scalable, repeatable behaviors? 
how do you get to those people? How do you see the, how do you see that data? I don't know. I don't know if that makes sense. I don't know if that's the best example, but you know, I'll give you another example about using data. Like for anyone who's worked in a call center and is dealing with a turnover, if you're a call center manager, you only got so many hours a day and people will love to come in and talk to you. And you tend to spend time with the loud ones, the people who are oh, always in your office, the squeaky wheel. But what about the quiet one? What about the quiet one who goes unnoticed? If you're a manager, being able to see the data in, the, uh, in front of you, easily accessible about the difference in productivity between the loud person and the quiet person, and then if you're able to use um, the emerging machine learning and artificial intelligence to predict without the noise of who comes into your office, who's really going to leave. Maybe it has to do with how many days they've taken off, or maybe it has to do with uh, the number of phone calls they're making or how they're socially networked within the organization. When you start to use data, you can understand the quiet person the person, uh, the person who's the hidden talent, you can start to see around corners and see who you're going to miss. Like I said, the things that aren't apparent to the naked eye, that's the power of using data in these talent decisions. And really understanding that. And, and it, what's really interesting, and you mentioned the book Moneyball, as you know, you're working I guess for the averages, the repeatable business, the the repeatable actions and really using the data that's integrated with the businesses and the processes that are in there. But what are your thoughts when it comes to, you know, those those people, those out sitting outside on, on the outliers that do hit the home runs, but they're not doing doing the averages? Like, does the system or is there type of situations where you're like, oh, you know what? There are some special people that don't fit into this norm. Yeah. And so that's that's the thing. Like, you got to have a balanced portfolio. It's like your 401k, right? You don't sit there and say, you know, last year that stock went up 100%. I know it didn't do it the year before or the year before that. Or, and I know it didn't do it the year after that. But, you know, remember that year where it went up and had that spike? I'm going to keep them around because it might happen again, right? That's not a great investment strategy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, <laughs> that said, you do have some of your portfolio that's a risk. The people who might hit the home run every once in a while, the elephant hunters. But if you try to replicate that as a sales strategy for your entire sales um, organization, you are at high risk. Great growth companies, and that's where we are. You know, we are in that growth company stage. The trick is to find a formula that, yeah, it gives you some of those outlier winners, but for the whole, it's repeatable, it's predictable, it's scalable. And for that, you got to have data behind it. You got to find that that is a pattern. And patterns aren't always, a, you know, visible to the naked eye when you're in the moment making people and emotion decisions. I mean, that's amazing. That, that's really exciting. And I, I love talking about things like this and especially me having a tech background, being an engineer, really understanding the data that's behind it now and stuff that really enforces the things that we probably knew in the gut before, but we didn't have the data. So that that's really amazing. Um, Paul, I wanted to just switch gears and as you mentioned, you've been pretty much working with people, um, HR capacity or HR technology for a greater part of your career. You led different organizations. You mentioned you're in consulting as well. I'd love it if you could share maybe maybe uh, some type of difficult decision that you had to make, whether it was earlier in your career, recently, that really helped you grow as the grow as a you know inspiring business leader you are today. Oh my God. Um, you know, I, I, I've done some things I'm really proud of, but, um, let's talk about something I'm not proud of that. I think I learned a lot from, but oh, well, I like, I like where this is going. Um, <laughs> I left the job because I was impatient. I left a job because I couldn't understand why the leaders around me were making such silly decisions. I left a job because I didn't feel like I was having enough impact quickly. Um, 
I left a job because I was disappointed that the leaders around me weren't better than I wanted, weren't as good as I wanted them to be. And in hindsight, I wonder how impatient I was at that time, because it was a great company. And, you know, some days I look back and I, I wish I was still there. How impatient was I young in my career? And did I have the context to understand the decisions those leaders were making? Did I have the big picture that maybe if I did, I'd be making the same trade-offs they were making? Because often when we disagree with a leader's decision and we're working for smart people, it's because we didn't have all the facts or they didn't clearly communicate all the facts. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, and I think, you know, look, good things happen to me after that. I, I mean, I, I can't, I can't complain, but I look back at that. And one of the things I learned is a, be a little more patient and a little more forgiving of some of the leaders around you. But B, when you do get in a leadership position, it's okay to give people the context. It's okay to help people understand how you're making the trade-offs around a decision. It's not about just, you know, I am in charge, I'm gonna make this decision and everyone will follow. Or even, hey, my personality or my gravitas will inspire the people around me. If you really wanna have lasting inspiration over people, help them understand the trade-offs you made around those decisions and help them understand that every, every business decision, use of capital, who to, who to keep, who to get rid of, which market to address or not address, which feature to promote or not promote, they're all trade-offs and no business decision is so binary that it's perfect. I, I really love the, the example uh, in that decision that you brought up because in hindsight, Paul, and I'm wondering when that full 360 vision, that 360 wisdom kicked into play as you became a leader and it really probably formed how you communicated earlier on as within your first or second leadership roles, right? Yeah, I tell you, you're, you're always growing. Um, and you have to have the humility to know that uh, you must always grow and you are not perfect. And humility is, is something that's really important. And I really have, big, you know, appreciate more and more in my own life. Uh, I will tell you, you want a real kick in the pants? Mm -hmm. you try to, you know, you enter a um, team where you're leading a bunch of leadership consultants and you're the only guy without a Ph.D., uh, and here's a group of people that coach CEOs and you yourself are trying to herd those cats, man, you learn a lot about yourself in those moments. Wow. That, 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 that's a, that, that, that's a, that's an interesting situation you're in. And sometimes I find myself in those situations, uh, you know, having, having this, this platform around leadership as well. And it's really just from general interest and I'm learning a lot. But I have a lot of these executive leadership consultants becoming my friends now. So it's, it's pretty interesting and humbling because you, there's a great wealth that you're learning as well. Um, you mentioned, Paul, you know, as you, know, you left maybe being impatient and you ended up moving and throughout your career, you moved a number of times. Yeah. And as you move within leadership roles, I wonder if you had or can share any of the challenges or opportunities when you made those transitions and how you, I guess, bring on the new team to you as, as a leader? Um, I, I think the, the key, the, I mean, there are a couple of lessons I've learned when you are moving into a new organization. Um, number one is you're probably gonna be 80% right on the reads of the people that you interviewed with but you're going to be 20% wrong. Mm -hmm. And because you, when you're in interview mode, you even, even the most seasoned people, 
you're on your best behavior. You are, you naturally show your best self and you can go in and like, I'm going to be authentic. I want them to know exactly what you're going to get. And you know, you, you say things to other leaders like, you know, I can be a real pain. Mm -hmm. Sure. They actually want to hear that. And the flip side is when you're um, with uh, the interviewing with the new leaders, you know, they're on, they're showing them their best selves also. Just know that you are going to listen with happy ears and that's okay. That's human. And just because you found some things when you joined a new company that weren't perfect, doesn't mean you didn't make the right decision. It is actually your opportunity to shape that new leadership team is in that void. The second thing is a lot of people are looking for, you know, I, I always tell I mean, most people don't look for money uh, later in their career. They're looking for, you know, the right team, the right fulfillment. The thing that I've uh, come to appreciate most to explore is look for your distance to impact. Understand exactly how much impact you can have not just on the direct team, but can you draw a path from the choices that you get to make or directly influence? And I don't know, whatever your measure is, shareholder value, revenue increase, stock price, which is a tough one because of markets, um, you know, margin, uh, product release schedule. Make sure you really understand what you want to go in there impact and what your distance to that will be. Today's sponsor is True Shield Insurance, Canada's most trusted insurer for entrepreneurs and small businesses. True Shield not only will help educate you on the risks of your business, but also provide unique solutions, including the ability to purchase your insurance online. Simply go to trueshield.ca, answer a few questions, and get your quote, which you can purchase. Let True Shield help protect what you've worked so hard to build. As you transition to a new role, a new company, Happy Years 8020, but realizing that maybe you're not as close to the impact as as you thought you would be, and have you been in that situation where you're you speak and try to get closer to that impact so you could really make a difference because you understand how to make the difference. Oh yeah. You, you first of all, you got to be bold. I mean, here's, here's the beauty of being in consulting is because you are a interloper in somebody else's culture and power dynamic, you have special permission to speak the ugly truths mm -hmm. to say, here's what's in the way of, success. And, you know, I don't want to oversimplify, but, you know, if you are in the leadership or talent business, most of the time when they're calling you in at this point, they've realized, although may, they may not have spoken it out loud, is the only thing standing between them and, you know, the success they deserve is the internal frictional cost of getting stuff done, be it decision making, be it the product release cycle, be it whatever it is. It's this own sort of invented angst and internal, um, you know, this, they're missing some WD-40 mm -hmm. either, either and, and it's either an act of omission or, com or, or commission in behaviors or process. And as a consultant, you can come in and just call that out. But once you're inside, you immediately develop this radar on political sensitivities and you start to immediately play not to lose rather than play to win because you're like, oh, my God, I'm in with these people for a long time. Yeah, I'm going to have to go a little bit slower. I'm going to have to tread lightly. I have to build these political relationships. I have to do all these things. I'm not saying break glass, but they brought you in because they were missing something. And you have to remain true to yourself of, I'm here to cut through and make a difference. I'm, hit, I'm here to cut through and make that impact. And if I find that I'm not doing it and I misread the path to that impact, find a new path, but don't become complacent. Otherwise, you yourself then become part of that frictional cost of improving the business. 
Paul, you, you mentioned earlier um, when we were talking about learnings and always continually to grow. I'm wondering um, if you have some type of activity um, or something that you do that helps you continually grow as a business leader. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, I try to read. Uh, I, I read more periodicals than um, uh, than long form books anymore. I spend some time, uh, like some of my greatest release, I, I go to, I'm a soul cycle addict. I love it. <laughs> uh, I get on, I get on that bike and you know, the guy who's in the back row, who's probably too big for the bike and is never quite on beat and has his eyes closed because you think he's paying attention to the music, but he's actually thinking about something else. Yeah. I, I gotta tell you, a lot of my personal development is in those moments. Oh my gosh, I love it! I love it, and and who knew, and who knew you're working out as well at the same time, right? But but I but I think it goes back to that sort of you know if you disassociate from the problem, uh, you can probably get closer to a better solution. I remember I used to uh, when I lived in San Francisco, I would go to that Costco. And sometimes I would listen to a conference call or I would just walk up and down the aisles. I'm not a crazy person. Uh, it's actually, you know, it was explained to me later that the repetitive um, visions that you were having, you know, starts to calm the brain in a certain way to, uh, you know, let those other patterns emerge uh, and allows you, you know, it's, it's actually a very calming thing. Um, what is it? If you don't take care of yourself, how are you going to take care of others? Mm -hmm. I think some of the best professional leadership stuff um, that uh, you know managers can do, the best professional development um, stuff, is take some time off, man. Stop thinking. Create some white space in your head. That's when the good stuff comes inside. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, given your experience, Paul. Um, being in the business of people, workforce management, and me being sort of a, a geek and understanding <laughs> the new technologies that are coming out there, I'd love to get your thoughts on how leaders should now prepare for the next generation workforce with like the new innovations like big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning coming into the, the workplace now. So um, I, I, I think it starts with... Uh, Everybody has to overcome inertia and look around them at the business processes that are there and say, are they digital capture ready? So why do we have KPIs? You know, because we want to measure our business. What's in those KPIs? Often I find it's the things uh, we measure those things because we can, not necessarily because they're the most important things to measure. Right. So, you know, uh, let's let's look at um, uh, let's look at something like as simple as, uh, you know, um, customer servicing in a software business. Yeah. Time tracking is annoying. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of change resistance. I just want to help customers. I, I you know, I don't want that overhead of, you know, capturing the moment I spent on what customer and what type of problem, et cetera, you got to get over that. You got to actually, you, you're going to need that data, right? You're going to need that data so that you can analyze new patterns. But the faster you get a reverse loop on those patterns, right? Um, and give it back to the people who gave you the data, you start the upward spiral of collecting new data. And that's the second thing is be fearless in collecting new data. Find new ways to make it easier. Observation, inferred, passive scraping, all those different things you can do uh, around the workforce. I'll give you, I'll give you another one, like um, network analysis. Uh, you know, do you understand who is actually, can, you know, emailing who, slacking who, meeting with who? Uh, be able to follow those patterns within your um, workforce. Finding new data about. Um, the new class of data around assessment, assessment science has come so far. Uh, people aren't great judges of character 
why don't we give them the same assistance we do um, by giving them access to psychometric instruments and cognitive ability testing so that instead of guessing what type of person they are, uh, we can measure what type of person they are. Um, and, and I think that that's, that's really important. We hoard data from a lot of frontline managers. Uh, they can't see the P&L. They can't see, you know, certain metrics. But we want them to make small decisions that are connected to larger strategic uh, areas. So we have to be able to embrace analytics in a way that captures new types of data, strings it together for people, and puts it in the hands of people who are far from the C-suite. And the C-suite can now use that data to give guideposts and guardrails so the small decision, remember, great strategy doesn't fall apart at the C-suite. It falls apart in execution because people don't know how to connect a tiny decision to it. So if we talk about new technology, embrace the assistance you get from machine learning and AI. Don't relinquish, right? Mm -hmm. But embrace it. You wouldn't drive across the Bay Area without programming your course in ways so that you knew the traffic patterns. Why would you not give your frontline manager the best market intelligence, business intelligence, et cetera, so they could make decisions too? Yeah, no, that's great. Really appreciate that. And I like how you gave very concrete examples and we'll definitely sum up a lot of that stuff and might even be coming to you for, for key, more key examples, Paul. Thank you for that. Can you name a person who had a tremendous impact on you um, personally? Um, as a business leader, maybe someone who mentored you, a past leader, a past manager? Uh, you know, I, I have to say, uh, I work for a guy right now, um, Ryan Wong. He's uh, one of the founders here. He's an engineer. <laughs> He's really smart. <laughs> and uh, I've worked for a lot of, of, of smart people, but like uh, the engineering mindset, and I've worked in a lot of industries. But the engineering mindset is, um, it's kind of amazing. The ability to detach from the problem and look for as many facts first before you, you know, find the point at which you have to depart from the facts and with suspending that judgment, um, that's a really important skill and an important discipline. And uh, I'm grateful for the way uh, he uh, and a lot of the rest of this team has immersed me in that sort of engineering mindset. That's been really, it's been a real formative thing for me in the last year. Well, that's great. And I, I'm sure it's very eye-opening as well. So I guess, Paul, on the flip side, a little fun question. By the way, I, I, I can talk about like five or six of these sort of life-changing people, but that's probably another podcast <laughs> oh, and, and we might have to do that again because re <laughs> we're really fascinating in terms of you know i mean even for me like i'm learning uh, quite a bit as well so happy to get uh, get all those people but if you want to give shout outs for sure yeah you know look i mean i can give a bunch of shout outs you know i can go all the way back to uh, uh marcia sussman uh who was a partner at mercer and mm -hmm. she deconstructed the way i um approached every client situation. Uh, and I'll, I'll never forget feeling horrible under her coaching. Like I was doing everything wrong and how it was breaking down to build back up in a kind supportive way, but very clear that you cannot be successful. And this important lesson she taught me, which was your style will limit your effectiveness. Mm -hmm unless you can be mindful enough to adapt your style in long arc and short arc moments, your important message and the change you want to create will be lost. And that leads you to understand, you know, you know, is your style part of your ego? Does it, you know, at, at what point does your greatest strength become your derailleur? There's 
lots of things like that. But that's another shout out. And I think an important lesson that everybody has to face in their career. You know that- what are the things that made me great? Which of those things are holding me back? Yes. And which ones do I have to let go of? I mean, and that, that's a huge lesson, which, uh, um, as you said, business leaders, as they grow, learn to really accept it and, and hear from it. But it, but I think ultimately for those who are listening and maybe whether they're starting their career or getting into their first leadership management position, it's it's really letting go of that ego and being open to to hearing from people who want you to succeed um, because you trust them and they probably are looking out for you to, to get better as well. Exactly. You know, that trust thing is another thing. Um, you know, I will tell you that uh, I, I, I've done a lot of work on trust with organizations and uh, it's clear to me that you need to have a group of people with a growth mindset not a scarcity mindset. If you're going to have trust, if you are working in a company where, um, and this is usually what happens, you know, people have forgotten how to grow. So they're fighting over the existing revenue or they're fighting over capital allocation and all of their energy is on, you know, if I have something, somebody else can't have Mm -hmm. it. And we all know companies that are like that. And we've all been with leaders that are like that. They, you know, I must, I must assemble my head count. I must have the biggest, um, uh, I must have my portfolio must have the most number of people in it. They're all the revenue must be under my control. The energy expended in that, I do believe leads to a negative place. When you have a growth mindset, like there are so many opportunities in the world. I've just got to go get them. Um, that there is abundance out there in the world. Uh, people are attracted to that and it's a, and it creates an area of trust. And when people have both a growth mindset and trust, they take the right risks and they attract the right customers and they attract the right kind of talent that's going to grow over many, many quarters. I love that, how you really brought it into the way we think we, when it comes to mindset and, and thinking positively around around growth. And that's everything. It could be personal growth, business growth, uh, <laughs> everything that, that does that. So I really appreciate you sharing it. And I just I wanted to really quickly ask you, and on the flip side, as we looked to those who helped us grow, Paul, I'm wondering what, um, it's really a fun question. What <laughs> If I were to ask any of your team members, colleagues, it could be in, past presence, you know, what's the best leadership quality that you possess? What do you think they would say? Oh, for me, they'll probably talk about enthusiasm, (laughs) like, and passion. Like I am, I am deeply connected to my work. Uh, I am deeply connected to the mission that we're on and you can't escape it Mm -hmm. and it can be infectious. Like I am, I am a true believer. I I really believe that people analytics, when you start to go beyond what our eyes show us and what our, you know, what our past experience tells us and add to that data and facts and patterns, it gives voice to people who may not have a voice. It helps us unlock individual and organizational potential in ways that we couldn't see because now we see everything through the data. That's really important. You know that, I believe in it. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And, and having a, a leader within an organization, and I'm sure you had some that shared passion and enthusiasm, it's, it's really easy to follow them and follow the mission as well. So really thank you for sharing that. And, and honestly for myself and for those who are listening, I could, I could feel it. I could feel your enthusiasm. I could feel your passion and, and it's pretty apparent coming through. Lastly, um, what else is going on? I know you're six months into your Canadian voyage, um, but I love it. If you could share any other special projects, initiatives or anything fun or personal that uh, you are really excited about and, and maybe, maybe losing some sleep. 
Oh my God, I'm losing sleep over the fact that I have a, uh, my first trip to Japan ever uh, is coming up, as well as my first trip to Vietnam <laughs> uh, later this year. And uh, the planning consists of so far flights and hotels. And there's so much eating to be done in Japan that I'm in an absolute panic that we won't be able to fit it all in. <laughs> <laughs> like we're going to have to rewatch every single Anthony Bourdain episode, copy down the restaurants and try to recreate that. Plus whatever eater tells you it's overwhelming. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I guess we could also put it out there to the listeners. If you're out there or have any recommendations, let us know, let Paul know. Um, and hopefully he could check them all out. Um, love to get your final thoughts. And Paul, you gave, you shared so many nuggets of information from your journey, your experience. Um, I'd love it if you could share one final one, um, ideally an actionable item that uh, that you can share to those who are listening today. Oh, look, I, yeah, I think the biggest enemy in both individual and corporate performance today is inertia. Like I see it every day. We do the same thing over and over again, or we, you know, we're like, oh, you know, I've already got so much sunk cost in this. Like I look at it in our market, like in our market, you know, I think about the way we've always approached analytics, a bunch of consultants, a bunch of data warehouses, a bunch of SQL, a bunch of, <laughs> uh, you know, visualization tool licenses, you know, that whole disjoint analytics tools approach to BI that costs a lot of money, right? But a lot of people's jobs are vested in it. And along comes something like Vizier, which is a analytics application that says, man, you know, if the questions are pre-built and the visualization tools can be used by non-experts and you, you know, the data warehouse goes to the cloud, you don't need all that. Yeah. But you're going to have to overcome inertia. Like the job is the person is the project. It's really hard. But, you know, we see that in our lives, uh, all kinds of inertia. Uh, you know, it, it's like when I used to talk about HR, an HR program in motion stays in motion forever, even if you forgot why you started it in the first place because nobody wants to have the noise of taking it away or that it's somebody's job to administer that program, yeah. even if it doesn't make any business sense anymore. We see that happen all the time from service awards to vacation policies to pay programs. <laughs> Take the time to say, where are we now? Why do I do what I do? Approach a problem with the beginner's mind rather than the old noise. And I bet you'll get to the courage to get to a better place. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Uh, the last tidbit of information. Really appreciate that. Really enjoying our time together, Paul. It's been great. So to close, can you share where we can find more information about you, your company, or anything else you'd like to share with us today? So, uh, you know, definitely check out www.vizier.com, uh, V-I-S-I-E-R. Uh, and you can uh, learn all about us. Uh, if you're in the HR technology space, uh, you can check us out and meet us down at uh, Gartner in October in Orlando. I think I have that date wrong, but definitely HR Tech in Vegas is the big show. You know, there's some, I'm terrible at social media. So I think what you're telling me is to post more on LinkedIn. You can check out some of the writings, uh, our collective writings here at the company at our Clarity Magazine. You can find that on the Vizier website. Paul, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for joining us on the Business Leadership Podcast. Thanks. It's my pleasure. Take care. That's it, Biz Leaders. Thank you for joining me. On another episode of the Business Leadership Podcast, this was episode number 124 with Paul Rubenstein. If you want to learn more about Paul, this year Inc., or anything else that we discussed, please go to thebusinessleadership.com slash 124. Join me on my private Facebook group where I will discuss this episode. I'll answer your questions and connect you with other like-minded business leaders. Simply search for the Business Leadership Group, directly in Facebook. 
Thank you again to today's sponsor, True Shield Insurance, Canada's most trusted insurer for entrepreneurs and small businesses. If you haven't done so yet, please subscribe, rate, and leave a comment on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening today. Once again, thank you for taking the time to join me. I truly appreciate your time. Edwin signing off. Thank you for listening to the Business Leadership Podcast at thebusinessleadership.com. The